whether we grieve or celebrate, we do so in your presence. For nothing, no part of our life is beyond your care, your mercy, and your love. We give you thanks for the gift of encouragement that we can offer one another, the gift of life that we can share with one another, the gift of love which sustains us and those that we know and those we have yet to meet. We also know that when we are going through those valleys and wonder if the light will ever return. We know that with, as the psalmist said, even there, your love will find me. Even in the pits of despair, your love will sustain me. Even when life ends, your love will carry me. Gracious God, loving Christ, sustaining spirit. Be with those gathered here and those who are elsewhere, but ever present in our hearts and on our minds. We ask your presence and your love to be with us as we offer that prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, uh, starting, uh, or excuse me, in the 12th chapter, starting in the 20th verse. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was, at, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
To God be the glory indeed. Our second lesson today, I just love this, this one. Uh, I hope you will as well. From the 31st chapter of the prophet Jeremiah. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No. This is the covenant that, that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will no longer need to say to each other, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <sighs> Jeremiah is sometimes in some commentaries referred to as the weeping prophet. One of the three major prophets along with Joshua and Ezekiel. Jeremiah was active between 627 and 586 BC. So beginning with the, the reign of King Josiah and ending with the Babylonian exile under King Zedekiah. We know more about Jeremiah than I think really all the other prophets because Jeremiah had a scribe, an aide, a disciple named Baruch, and you'll hear more about him this summer. But Baruch tells us some personal details of Jeremiah. And in the 31st chapter, we hear the phrase, declares the Lord. Now, some of your translations, depending on which you read, might say, thus says the Lord. And this is one of those all caps, bold print, underlined, italicized, you know, whatever you want to do to it, circle it four or five times. If it says, thus says the Lord, or declares the Lord in this case, it is not just important. Pay attention. It is, forget everything else you're doing. Forget the next breath you were thinking of drawing. Pay attention to this. Because in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, that phrase is used 12 times. And if the number 12 appears in scripture, it's important, pay attention. So we have something that's important on its own. And then 12 times that, it's really important. And if that weren't enough, wait, there's more. Seven times the phrase, the Lord proclaims. So you have three significant offerings in this passage. Thus says the Lord, or declares the Lord. Twelve, the complete number of the tribes of Israel. Seven, the days of creation. The Lord proclaims, the Lord saying this. Not only am I saying this, but I want you to put it on your heart and Take it, well, take it as gospel, because it's true. 
How do we know that? Jeremiah outlines just why we can know this. He's writing to people in exile. Israel by this point and Judah had already suffered under the hands of the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Hittites, the Neo-Assyrians, the Babylonians. They would later get the Neo-Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, Egyptians again, the Romans. But right now, we're dealing with the Babylonians. And Jeremiah is telling the people, look, what you're going through, what you lost, is because of what you did. There was a covenant that was made between God and your ancestors. They swore on the holy mountain that they would be faithful to God and never forsake the covenant. Well, we know that didn't last. And so God is speaking to a people who have lost everything, their identity, their temple, their, their homes, everything they thought was central and important in their life was gone. And so the Lord offers this. The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. A new covenant. A new promise. A new way to relate to God. Because the first covenant, well, all the covenants that preceded this one, starting with Abraham and Sarah, all the way up through Moses and the giving of the law at Sinai, all those other covenants involved something like a, uh, well, a quid pro quo is kind of a, a crude way of saying it, but you do something, God, and you do something, people, and they came together. At Sinai, it was, this is how the world will know that you are my people because you are doing these things. You are not sacrificing to idols. You are not taking my name in vain. You are honoring your mother and father and so on. But this time, God makes a blanket statement to all of the people of Israel. The time is coming. How do we know? After all these years, I mean, this is what, 2,600 years ago? The covenant has already begun. The covenant that God established was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And because we say we follow Jesus, that we believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, that his way of life was our model for how to live in God's presence. And we know that Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you. So we know that nearly 2,000 years later, we are still living in the presence of God. And it's, it's one of those aha moments. We were talking earlier about, you know, when, does, when do we return to church? Well, 
we're in church right now, this very moment. We're not returning anywhere. Just as the people of Israel were not going to return to Jerusalem as they had known it. Now, eventually the Babylonian exile would end and the people would indeed return, but they would never again until 1948 be a nation. There's no going back to the way things were, God says. I saw once someone on, on Facebook said, we're not going back to normal because normal wasn't working all that well. It's this, it's this exciting moment when you realize that God is here, that with every breath you draw, you are pulling in the presence of God. With every breath you exhale, you are saying, amen. Do you feel that? As Paul said, you know, pray without ceasing. That's what you're doing. As long as you're breathing, you're praying. Mind-blowing. It really is. It's one of those moments where you say, wait a second, you mean all 614 ordinances, commandments, you know, instructions offered in the Old Testament are fulfilled with each breath I draw? Yes. And more. Because God is saying, you know, draw in the realization that written on your hearts is this promise that I am with you. That it doesn't depend on your status or your age or your knowledge or your race or gender or any other caveat or quotation marks or brackets you want to put on it. Thus says the Lord, from the least to the greatest, from those who stayed behind and those who are, who are coming back. Thus says the Lord, my covenant is a faithful covenant. Just as I led your ancestors out of Egypt, just as all those years ago, when Tom English, I got an email from him this week. I asked him, you know, how did uh, how did St. Paul's get its name? And he said, well, y'all were, they were already meeting by the time I got there for a few months. But I'm pretty sure it had something to do with, I think it's Chuck. Is it Chuck Miller? I think that was his name. Said that Jesus, you know, was, was perfect. And I can't really identify with him, but Paul was fought, flawed. And apparently Chuck was one of the early leaders of this congregation. We're not going back to 1964. We're following in the footsteps of those early St. Paulians or St. Paulites. We're following in, in the footsteps of Wesley and Calvin and Luther. We're following in the footsteps of Origen and Tertullian and Augustine. We're following in the footsteps of Paul and Timothy and uh, Dorcas and Mary. We're following in the footsteps of the Christ who said, follow me and I will show you life. 
That's what Jeremiah was hearing and what he shared with his people. Jeremiah wouldn't be there when they got back. Jeremiah was in exile in Egypt when the Babylonian captivity ended. But his words lived on. Because Baruch wrote them down. And because he wrote them down, they were preserved and shared with subsequent generations. And in this realization that this stream of faith that began with the first humans has carried along people and their dreams and their hopes and their fears and their trepidation and their birthdays and their death days. All along, God is saying, I was there. You were never alone. And the days are coming when you won't look to a book or a tradition or a, an institution, but you will feel it. You know, you can put, put your hand on, on your heart and feel each beat. That's the presence of God. Do you realize what that is? We know that one day each of us will pass away. We know that. But the people of God are not afraid of that day. And even though we might grieve our own losses, we know that written on the palm of God's hand are those whom God loves. In this time, when every day it seems we hear about more shootings, every day we hear about some far off corner of the world that's engaged in war or a famine or a typhoon or an earthquake or just down the street where someone loses a job or a relationship falls apart. In all of those times, it's easy to, to say, what's the point? Life is cruel, and when it's over, it's over, thank goodness. But God is saying to, to us, as with those Israelites in Babylon, you already know me. Look to your heart. Look to the promises I have already made and fulfilled. Feel my love and follow me. Live in my presence as I have always lived in your hearts. Amen. Surely the presence of the Lord
Surely the presence of the Lord is in each breath you draw today. Breathe in, people of God. Breathe out your thanks and share that with the world. Go in peace and go with God. Amen. Thank you.